Good day, and welcome to another episode of Masonic Curators. I am joined here today with Robert Jackson, who is a past master of At Montgomery Lodge. Montgomery Lodge here in Milford, Massachusetts. Uh, now, we're going to come back, but Milford has sort of an unusual history to it because, as Rob will tell you, the lodge really didn't come from Milford originally. There was another lodge here first uh, called Charity Lodge, and it's kind of unusual because I am a past master of Charity Lodge, but of course I am not, I'm old, but I'm not that old. This Cherry Lodge was founded in the, I believe, the early 1820s. Uh, and it was one of those lodges that went out during the anti-Masonic era. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. But they were one of the first Masonic lodges here in Milford, and then Montgomery Lodge uh, moved here afterwards. So, first of all, a couple of unusual things that I want to ask you. Um, first of all, you're a Paul Revere Lodge. Yes, yeah. yes. We are uh, one of the older Paul Revere Lodges, founded in 1797, uh, chartered, um, with a uh, remanufactured charter on, on the wall. The original is in the museum in Lexington. Which I also understand a number of other uh, lodges are doing that now, including, I believe, King Solomon, another uh, uh, Paul Revere Lodge, is doing that also. It, it's tough because there is so much history, like national history. Um, within within a lot of our lodge buildings, I mean, you look around here, and, and some of the st uh, pictures of past masters are on street signs and high schools and in town that are all named after people that were members of this lodge. Mm -hmm. And when you see something that happened, um, like that uh, lodge that went up in flames, where they lost everything, uh, it's scary to think about the fact that that much history can just go away in the blink of an eye. Blink of an eye. Um, so, as a Paul Revere lodge. Uh, for those who may not know, um, it was some, I think a lot of myths come from our past. Um, a lot of times, and when I was a young mason, I was always told, well, when Paul Revere constituted a new lodge, he made the jewels for the lodge. Well, as things progressed, <laughs> and you learn more about Freemasonry, and you go to other lodges, uh, Paul Revere didn't, you know, always make the law, uh, the jewels, and Paul Revere got paid for making the jewels. <laughs> okay, a little bit different than just Paul saying, "Okay, well, I constituted. Here's a set of, you know, thirteen jewels for you out of silver." Um, I presume that he or you guys commissioned him to have a set of jewels. So we do have a set of jewels for the top three officers, um, and they are locked safely away in a in a safe. Uh, I don't know for sure if they are Paul Revere, Paul Revere jewels, but I know they are silver and they are very, very old. Okay. So more than likely they probably are. Yeah. And I presume you still have records going back to that time period. We should. We we do have. Uh, we have a centennial book that was written uh, just over a hundred years ago, and a bicentennial book um, about what twenty five years ago that was put together uh, to go back and and. Look at some of that history and what was happening. And you have the minute books dating back to that period? We do. So hopefully, if somebody wanted to really do some in-depth research, you might be able to find something in the minute. <laughs> really do some in-depth research, you might be able to find something in the minutes. I'm feeling a little pressure right now, right, to be able to go <laughs> and do this on my own. Research! Research! <laughs> Always do the research. And when you've done the research, do more research. Uh, yeah, research, um, guys, is, is, always, is always up there, um, especially if, if you're talking about stuff like this uh, of, of Masonic Lodge, and, and you know, you can't always cover something, and sometimes it takes generations. Uh, Rob might pick up from where the last one left off, and he might pass it off to somebody else. Uh, it's, a, it's an always an ongoing um, a thing to, to keep up with the research uh, because people miss things and new things come to light, new members come into the lodge. So history is always, as I always tell people, history has no timeline. Um, when we think about history, we think of that's in the past. It's not. History is the past. It's the present. And it is the future. History has no timeline. 
So it's always, as this right now, we won't see this taping until maybe, I believe, uh, February. It would always be in the past by the time we're done and this comes up. So the past is always going on. The building. The building. It was not always Masonic. It was not. It was originally an Oddfellows building. And uh, we estimate that it's about 150 years old. Uh, we moved here in 63, 1963. We had another building down the street um, that was, I think it was three or four floors high. And when we did our bicentennial um, history, there was actually a couple of brethren that were involved in that, that were raised in that building, um, which is pretty cool. Although fire took place in, in that building and wiped out the first, uh, the top floors. The building is still there, but it's only two floors now instead of the three or four that it was. Um, I don't know, I, don't, I haven't done the research, I don't know um, what happened at the time with the Oddfellows, uh, but I do know there's an Oddfellows branch in Franklin, Massachusetts, which ironically was our first location, not their particular location, our Montgomery Lodge started in Franklin. And um, we've had, we have some members that are actually belong there as well. Okay. And some interaction, we've traded off some of the materials that were part of this building to offer to them. And of course, much later, there was a Franklin Lodge, which I think might still be active today. I'm not too sure. Uh, but there was a Franklin Lodge yeah. uh, in Franklin, Mass, much later, uh, that took over a converted church. And unfortunately, a number of years ago, fire struck that building. The, the lodge was long gone, but the townspeople still considered it as the Masonic Temple, yep. the Masonic Building, and that completely burned to the ground. I think the only thing that was left that was able to be saved was the front, uh, front entranceway okay. of the building. Everything else was completely destroyed. Um, so you were founded in Franklin, Massachusetts, Franklin. not Milford. Correct. Uh, Cherry Lodge was founded in Milford, Milford. Massachusetts, not Franklin. <laughs> and there was a Franklin Lodge that was founded in Franklin. Um, when did you guys move to Milford? Do you have any idea? Um, it was in the late 1800s okay. that we ended up moving to Milford, um, well after the anti-Masonic period. During that time, we've had 13 locations total. Uh, the first one was uh, the Nathaniel Miller House in, in Franklin. And there was a lot, of, a lot of homes, a lot of farms. Yeah. Um, and then uh, during the anti-Masonic period, it moved quickly from house to house to house. Uh, that's how we racked up the, the 13. And then we've been, I think this is our fourth location in Milford, in Milford oh. proper. Okay. And, and so we've been here for a while, over a, yeah, definitely late 1800s in Milford. Now you are also one of the lodges that has had a large merge with it. Yep. Uh, uh, Blackstone yep. Lodge, which actually met in a small town called Blackstone, Massachusetts. Excuse me, which they also had a Masonic building. Uh, and I know you have a bunch of, excuse me, memorabilia from them as well. We do. Uh, so now you have a lot of memorabilia. Um, and we, Chuck, you and I just quickly discuss that. And I know I'm going to throw you under the bus here uh, with this question. But with so much memorabilia, I, I've been here a number of times and you, you and I have talked uh, about the various things that I have found and I explained to you what this is and what that is. Um, uh, I mean, they have a whole bunch of the old card tables in the back when the days when the Eastern Star used to do card games uh, with all of the advertisements on it and stuff and, the, and that $2,000 uh, sword that the Tyler used to like to play with and I told him, no, 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 uh, that's been put away. Uh, but there's so much stuff that's here. Uh, and, you know, I, I know, like in my building and many other buildings, the, it's not the guys don't care about it. Um, how do I put it in a nice way? They just don't care about it. <laughs> Uh, no, it's um, probably the, the, the best way that you put it was they don't know the history about it. <clears throat> they don't know its value. It's almost a disbelief that it could actually have any meaning or have any value, right? Um, it's the assumption that it's just old junk, right? It's not doesn't have any value or, or there's a million of these things around, right? Um, which in some, and we've seen that, right? As part of our fraternity, there's lots of stories, there's lots of things that have, that have been told that aren't necessarily true. They've been, you know, um, dramatized or whatever like that, right? 
So you could pick up something and go, oh, you know, maybe this is from Solomon's Temple, or maybe this just fell out of somebody's pocket 50 years ago. Right. You don't know, and, and I think um, maybe people have gotten burned or in the past, or it's just a, a disbelief that it could have any value. Right. right. And, and then even when you have somebody knowledgeable, right, that will come and talk to us about that, even that, then sometimes it's difficult to get people motivated to take care of it and display it, or just put it in a safe and lock it away. They get into a rut, I guess. Um, but I mean, we see it with our parents, we see it with our neighbors, right? Where it's just, stuff accumulates. Accumulates. Over the and, years. And it's, you know, again, it's, it's you know, not bad-mouthing anybody, this is just the way they, they are. I, I've seen this in Masonic buildings time and time and time again. And, and it's the reason why you read sometimes that, yeah, we're cleaning the lodge uh, this weekend, come on down and, you know, and, or you see auctions like recently, um, the auction, what was that, Chuck, in Illinois, um, where they, they finally, uh, thankfully, were able to, uh, there was, I think, two or three lodges that had merged, and some of you guys may, when you see this, remember that, that was on um, uh, Masonic uh, Antiques and Collectors site, uh, as well as a few other sites, that they were selling some of their memorabilia. Uh, yeah, we just, when we have two or three or four lodges that merge, we just, we inherit all the stuff, then what do we do with it? Um, you know, we don't throw, we don't throw it away. Uh, that's one of the no-nos in Freemasonry. No, 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 no. But then again, you know, what do you do with it all? Um, well, you know, Chuck and I both agree, and there might be some of us on Masonic Curators on the crew that don't believe in this either, but, you know, I'm firmly believe sell it. If you can't use it, why have it in a yeah. back room where it's going to get damaged by either human hands, yep. uh, Nick, dust, <laughs> dirt, God forbid you have water, God forbid you have fire. Yep. Uh, well, there's also other things, if I can interrupt you for a sure. second. So, um, Masonic funeral services, right? Something that we're all kind of obliged to be able to, to, to do and, and um, I'm very grateful for the ones that I'm able to take part in, including my father's. Um, there's a set of regalia that the lodge needs for that, right? right? Collars, you, you need a, a, a marshal's baton, right? You need some aprons. Some of these things that are older, that aren't being used, they can be put aside for purposes of putting together a funeral box so that when the day comes, you don't need to go running around the lodge, picking exactly. up collars, trying to find it to put together a box, right? Assemble something like that so you have it readily and easily available so you don't even have to think about it, right? right? Old square and compass, little Bible, the, you don't need a whole lot. Right. Yeah, and, with some and of these some, Yeah, yeah. yeah that's one useful. way to, to, to reutilize some of these things. Um, and another way is, is what some of the guys did there in Illinois. They, they traveled there to the site and bought some of the stuff and taken it back to their lodge. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you can always ask around. Uh, this is how uh, the new lodge up at the up at Aleppo Shrine uh, Cemetery was able to uh, get some of the chairs and benches. Uh, from a lodge that went out mm -hmm. and they had a building and didn't have all the stuff. What do you yep. do with it all? Yep. Uh, storage is not the question, is not the answer. Um, and luckily they were able to, you know, get a full set of furniture and pedestals and chairs and furnish the lodge room up there. Yep. Uh, so yeah, you got to ask around and, and see what they have. But yeah, but like I said, Chuck and I, we're in the agreement that, you know, if, you, if it's sitting around and uh, you don't put it up, up on the wall for someone to look at, and you might have two or three of the same Masonic cha. Mm -hmm. You don't need two or three of the same Masonic cha. Sell it. Yeah. And that money can be used for something around the building or your lodge room, um, or for the widows. Yep. I mean, God, we, and I don't mean to put down any Masonic lodge, but you know, we don't do enough work for the widows. We forget about them. I know my mother was one, and she was forgotten about. We don't do enough. I know lodges do a lot of work for some, a lot of lodges don't. But that's money that could be used for something to bring them to lodge to have a meal for. Yeah. Something. You know, and this is just stuff that's just sitting around. And your building, my building, I, you know, I've been in a lot of buildings, and there's, you open up and there's like, oh my God, closets full of stuff. What do we do with them? But we're getting off topic here <laughs> because we're talking about other stuff. But the, the, there is a level of anxiety in there as well, where it's you look at it like I really should be doing more. I need to be doing more, and, and 
let's face it, li- lives are busy, you know, <laughs> in this day and age between lodge and kids and work. And it's, it's difficult to, to take the time that you, folks like you and Chuck have done to research a lot of this, to understand it. Um, so a lot of us, we, we need help. We are so now more intertwined with the family yeah. that we just don't have time to give to our lodges that 110% that our past brothers have given. But we can combine it. Yes. When my kids, I mean, my kids essentially kind of grew up in this lodge. And when they walk around, they still look at some of the, you know, the stained glass. And they look at some of the things that I show them, the tools from 1872. And and they're dumbfounded sometimes at how old some of this stuff is, some of these materials are. And I, I love being able to share that with them, right? Because... My family is, you know, father, grandfather, great grandfather, all involved in lodges. So I have some of their old things too, and it just it it becomes personal. And right. I like to share that that something personal with me with my kids, so they understand a little bit more about who I am, even though I might not realize who I am yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good point. Yeah, intertwine it with the family today uh, to try to get them exposed to it. Now. The building started off as an art fellow building. Yes. Uh, folks, uh, for Masons, if you're in Milford area, get to come to visit the lodge. Uh, it's a really cool building. They've done a great job. They've got a great kitchen downstairs, nice banquet hall. They've got a nice museum room. They've got a nice membership room with a bar in it. Oh, I'm not supposed to say bar, sorry. You can uh, edit that, not. It uh, has a bar in it. Uh, the pool have tables a, and TVs. Pool tables, TVs. They've got a nice lodge room up here. Uh, lots of nice stuff on display. Um, but the interesting thing that I noticed when I first came here a number of years ago, because it, I didn't know the history, is like, why is there an Odd Fellows door knocker on this door? Because it was an Odd Fellows Hall. Uh, if you do come here, there's a staircase that leads you upstairs to the second floor of the lodge room. You turn around, and there's a beautiful hand carved Odd Fellows banner display case that the lodge still has here. Yep. Uh, and the nice thing is they've reutilized that by putting their own lodge banner in it. It's a beautiful hand done display, handmade display case. Um, but there's little, little hints of Odd Fellowship still here and there in the building. And as we were just discussing here, um, that it's unusual that the downstairs, they would have had two large rooms. You know, they have a downstairs room that has the door knockers on it. But then in this room here, they have a stage. And um, come to find out, I said, well, it could be that the Oddfellows large room was downstairs, which is now sort of a mini large room, meeting room, slash... It's like a media room, there's a projector in there. A um, room. Trying to build up a, a library, like a... Um... Uh, a library with, with actual useful information books, not just minutes. Sorry, I know minutes are useful information. I, <laughs> um, uh, you know, various books of, of history about lodge, whether it's on the philosophy side or whether it's on the history side, that, that people can come in and just borrow. Uh, uh, but yeah. that might have been the lodge room. Yep. And this room here, as I was telling Wish for Rob, is, was probably the banquet hall. Because in many cases, you have a stage. Uh, it would be very unusual in the large room to have a stage unless they were constantly doing theatrical drama sections, which yes, they did, but I don't think there was a need for the stage here in the large room. So, and not behind the master's chair? Yeah, and not That's behind the master's chair. one chair that you probably don't really need yeah. a lot. Um, so very well that this could have been the banquet hall, and I have seen that reversal, um, where the banquet hall is above the large room. Uh, in some of the buildings. So, you know, it, it, it could have been. We used to have a, it was a large curtain where that yes. blue wall is now. Um, there was a large, large curtain there and uh, it got to the point where every time the master coughed, you know, the piece would tear, right? Anything would cause that, that drapery to tear, it was so old. Um, so we ended up uh, getting rid of that and just putting a blue wall there. And I'm hoping that uh, I can find a nice Masonic artist to paint something uh, meaningful. Ryan Flynn. Ryan. <clears throat> uh, meaningful back there. So Excellent. Good. Now, before we, we adjourn, because we're, we're, we're going a little bit longer than the normal here, um, there is one thing that this, this room is, is that has fascinated me. Uh, and another reason why you all need to come to Milford to take, take a look at this. Uh, unfortunately, they don't have much history, but this could be a history project. Research, 
uh, that the worshipful master of this lodge could appoint, perhaps, maybe, uh, a, a worthy past master and or some of the new candidates. Uh, gives them something to do. And that is, and we're going to have pictures of these stained glass windows once this video is posted, but uh, in the large room you have four magnificent York Wright stained glass windows that I have ever seen. And I know a past master of the large made the window box. Yes. And it is actually a light box. Yes. Because you have, the, which is great, you have the light from the back shining uh, outward, uh, ex exposing the, the beautiful colors that are in these stained glass. And do you, yeah. I know you have very little history of it because of how they traveled, but can you give us some insight? So, um, uh, uh, late brother, uh, Mark Rossi, was in Maine at a garage and found the one, one of the York Wright um, uh, pieces of stained glass. And it was just kind of lying there and showed interest in purchasing it. And the lady that had them, uh, this is up in Maine, I think I said that. The lady that had them, she said that they came out of a church in Austin, Texas. Uh, and they would only sell them as a set. He didn't realize there was actual set. So there are three York Wright, and then there's the Blue Lodge uh, one as well. Uh, they were all dug out of, of storage out of this garage in Maine. They were kind of put together with cardboard between them. And uh, if you talk to uh, uh, worshipful brother Bernhard, who put a lot of the work into it, they were very flimsy. Right? It's real lead, uh, stained glass, didn't really hold together very well. Uh, so he had built these these casements for them with the LED lighting behind it, which fit perfectly on, on the shelf within the lodge. And we're looking up, we'll, we'll have pictures uh, for them, but they're absolutely beautiful. And, and we have a lot of public events, not a lot, we have some public events in this building, uh, in this room, and every time we have people in and they're lit up, it's just, it's breathtaking. It really is. Uh, they, <clears throat> to me, they, they actually do add to the room, and like I said, we're going to have pictures of them. Uh, uh, they, they are the four York right. Uh, as the lady said, they came out of a church, but were as I mentioned to the the, the group here that the, the the building that they came out of may have been a Masonic temple to begin mm -hmm. with, and that and there have been instances where a church moved in or bought the building afterwards and used it as a church. So you know it could have been. 25, 30, 40 years yep. uh, after the fact that the lodge moved out that you know the church used it. Uh, so yeah, according to them, it was a church, uh, not knowing it was an originally a Masonic temple. But you have at least maybe the area of Austin, Texas to work from, so that gives you an area. But you know, Masonic things do travel, so hopefully the, the story is correct that they came from Austin, and that's, uh, that's at least a stepping stone. But they, if you come here to Milford, it goes with the room. It really does. These wouldn't look good in, say, a, a newer 1960s building. Uh, these wouldn't look good in my building in Cambridge because of the way the architecture is. That's good because but, you can't have them. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, but in this room here, because you still have the, 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 the tin ceiling that's in here, uh, and, and it's amazing. And then you have the skylight yes. <laughs> that's yes. in the middle of the room. Uh, it just, it all flows together here. Uh, it's really a fascinating, fascinating room. Uh, but yeah, these are, these are beautiful pieces and I'm, I'm glad that the past master saved these. Uh, folks, you, once these go online, I, I don't know whether or not the photograph is going to give them justice on the coloring. I mean, the cryptic one, it has an aqua blue with a pinkish tone to it with greens and browns. The commandery is not your typical commandery colors. Again, it, it's an aqua blue with the, with the passion red uh, that's in it with, with beiges. And the, the chapter is also very much with the, with the, with the pinkish tone and the aqua blue uh, type of theme. And the, the blue large one, what's even nice about that, it doesn't have the G in the middle. It, it's, it's on the third degree, but it's just this plain square encompasses, but again, you've got the, the, the wreath of victory or the wreath of achievement uh, around it with the ribbon at the very top, uh, which sometimes indicates a tie to great architect of the universe. Um, but the colors in it mostly are pink. Uh, so 
And it sparkles. Sun. Like it, it sparkles. It just it's, it's, yeah. It's it does. It really. It, I've never really. I mean, I've seen some beautiful stained glass windows, but it does. It it sparkles. Whatever, well, it, someone did it. It's it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, what else can you tell me about the the lodge and the building worshipful? Um, well, what have we already talked about? My short term memory is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, we'd be uh, uh, operating the first Thursday of every month. We go dark for July and August. Um, but yeah, I, it's weird because this is the only, I was raised in this room by my dad. And uh, this was kind of the only lodge that I knew about. And sometimes it wasn't until I traveled that I realized how lucky we are to have this building in this lodge room. Um, but then also when I travel, I can become a little envious of what others have as, yes. as Warren, Rhode Island, right? Um, every one of these buildings and all these artifacts, they all have stories to tell. Yes. And uh, sometimes just walking up the steps, uh, I wonder about some of the great people in this community that have walked up those same steps. And it's just, um, you know, it's just uh, it's a weird feeling. Mm. Yes, as the worship was said, everything has a story the, you just need to, again sometimes you just need to sit down and do some research on it uh, and again as I mentioned in the past uh, episode um, with the medal that Chuck has from uh, Apollo Command Unit number one um, it's not going to take overnight it, it could take years it could take decades uh, to complete histories so with that if you don't have anything else to add, Worshipful, uh, we're done here at uh, Milford. Uh, we have a couple more episodes we're going to tape about some other, other items. Um, it's been a pleasure. I can't thank you and the Lodge enough for having Masonic Curators come in here today and, and do some taping. Uh, it, it is a magnificent Lodge building, uh, Lodge room. And yeah, I'm going to see if I can find somehow to take at least the Comanche. The Comanche, I hate to say it. The Commandery stained glass window is my favorite. Uh, at least uh, take a piece of that with me uh, one of these days. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have but, a lot of former Marines in this lodge. <laughs> you might want to be careful. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it, 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 there's a lot of great things here. Uh, I really do enjoy coming here every time. And I always find something new. Uh, when I do come here. So uh, with that, well, you're, uh, you're always welcome. And I mean, we had met years ago, I think when, when I was master of the lodge, trying to understand, you know, some of the history of some of these items. So um, I, I appreciate you and Chuck being resources to help educate, you know, and understand and, and share some of that knowledge, um, as well as the, ref the, the references of, you know, here is proof that yes, this really does have value. This really does have meaning. Right. This really does have a significant history to it. Um, to oh, everything it. does. Everything, believe it or not, does have uh, significance to it, just how you have to look at it. And uh, just like Freemasonry, um, it's in the eyes of the beholder, how you interpret it. Yep. Uh, everybody interprets the degree work in Freemasonry differently than the next, and the same with our artifacts. We each interpret that differently. Um, I thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. Uh, we will come back at some point in time, and there's a lot more here. So with that, uh, folks, give us a thumbs up. Uh, especially, uh, if you can, uh, pass the word about, about this video, especially when, the, uh, when you get the, uh, the stained glass uh, window pictures uh, posted. Uh, it's, it's really unusual. So um, pass the word about Masonic Curious to everybody. Uh, continue watching and thank you.